So good morning and welcome. Uh, I'm Kathy Dew. I'm the lead for the services team for Quali Student. And uh, today um, I'll be working with uh, Norm Wright, who's also on the service team. I don't know if you want to do a quick hi, Norm. Hi, how you doing? <laughs> and what we're going to do is try to get through as much uh, material as possible in an hour um, on, on services. What I thought I would do briefly, and, and I can go through this um, quickly, if I, I don't even have to go through it all if you've seen it before. I just thought I would give a little grounding on how our team structure works for enrollment. Is this a good thing? Or have you guys already started? And I cannot see the chat. Okay, good. So the, the center is really the, the core team um, for enrollment. The I'm, I'm coordinating the services piece right here. We've got uh, six, I think we're up to six full-time service architect and developers. Um, we've got a UX, a couple of folks on UX. Um, Carol Bershaw with product management and um, the analysis team. We've got some overhead like, oh, that Dan guy. Um, we've got a, a formal QA um, effort, and then Larry Sims with the development group. So that's kind of the, the core group. Then we have this idea of parallel development teams, and each of those has about nine people in it. Um, and uh, each of those is comprised of really a footprint, the same footprint of um, analysis, UX, services, dev, and QA. Um, for this discussion, I think the um, key for us is the, the, the individual on the parallel team that is the service development, the service implementation developer, will be pretty closely working with the service team. So I don't know if this helps or not. I just wanted to provide a little bit of grounding in how some of this um, works. So just starting out a couple of you know, we, we heard the SOA in, in Kuali Student. What is SOA? I'm guessing everybody here knows it, but just highlights interoperable services um, with the ability to really build out business functions as software components. Um, a big piece for us is really alignment with the business, and that's, that's a, a big aspect of it. In terms of some of the development advantages like software reuse, productivity increases, um, we're still really working on those, but uh, I, I think we will see those in our future. So what are service contracts? You know, they're really the definition, the operations or functions, and then the message structures, which describe the data objects and parameters. Um, the actual implementation of that contract then is what's going to um, interact with the persistence layer. And again, what we're really looking for is a way to have a stable component within and across Koali student as we move through the process. I'm actually going to turn it over to um, Norm right now, who's going to talk a little bit more about SOA and specifically how Koali student has approached it. Okay, so th 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 this slide basically tries to explain to you a little bit more about the history of, of Quali Student, but like so when you when you're interacting with it, you sort of understand the big pieces that we're we're dealing with there. And uh, SOA is just one part of it, but um, when we approached this project, it, you know we you know the the group um, decided that it was you know it's going to be a community source effort um, that was going to build a new system from the ground up. Uh, with a couple of things in order to make that possible so that we weren't just building uh, yet another uh, ERP that was inflexible and, and not be able to be usable by each of the institutions without you know, massive configuration. So one of them, one of those things was uh, rules and that we wanted the rules to be promoted to as first class citizens within the, within the system. That, you know, that a lot of the, the difference between the schools was in, in they all had different rules that they wanted to implement. Um, and also high level entities um, and we'll talk a little bit more about those, but that we wanted to have a certain level of abstraction about the things they talked about. And then the way to tie it all that together and to manage that was through SOA. Um, and then um, what, what happened was that the, the, the project, you know, adopted the Quali brand. And, um, and what that really basically means is that, you know, we're, we're using KRAD for our UI uh, front end that we use um, rice for all of the you know the infrastructure components that we're trying to talk about so that the the the, the identity management um, the permissions roles authorizations and uh, that that kind of stuff is all done uh, via the uh, and using the, the Kowali rice infrastructure 
Um, I, I promised you a little bit more discussion about the high level entities and, and I'm not going to go into super level detail on this but when, when the people sat down and they analyzed all, all the different systems that you think about for student systems, they're really the, just the rearrangement and the connection of, of, of a person or an organization to a particular learning thing and I'll call it a course or it's a program or, or it's an activity or whatever um, at a particular time. And so what they did is they sat down and they, and they modeled, um, modeled you know, what are in some cases fairly abstract uh, concepts around these things so that we don't get ourselves into the same binds that um, other systems had where, you know, in, in, uh, at, in the example of organization is that, you know, well, only academic departments offer courses. Well, no, that's not true. Uh, sometimes you have these weird little departments that, little organizational components that, that, that also offer courses. Um, and similar with people, you know, a lot of systems initially, and I don't know about uh, UAT's one, but uh, I, I know uh, my history was, was more at MIT in the beginning, you know, where they had separate tables for, this was the student table and this was the faculty table. And of course, then as students become faculty and faculty become students, it makes a mess. Um, time was another kind of thing where we sort of circled around where there's terms, but then there's people that have subterms and little tiny terms, and people want to teach courses at different time periods. Um, the big one is, is learning unit, and again, that's courses, and, and I wanted to model them as courses and programs and whatnot. So th this just gives you a, a better understanding. When we say learning unit, um, that's, that's just a, a way of typing. For, for your, I think a lot of you are developers on this call. I think maybe all of you are. Um, you sort of understand it's basically it's a it's a it's a way of doing inheritance in in, uh, in web services and so we basically can say there's an abstract learning unit but then there is a particular instance of a credit course and maybe particular instances of of different program objects which are majors and minors and whatnot so that's sort of the, the way we've got that uh, for configurability and a quick plug for type state training oh that's right that's right so there, there, there's a whole another training thing that actually is has been recorded. Um, there's two of them, one from a business perspective and one for a, a, a developer perspective that you can feel free to watch um, and uh, we can give you the links to them later on that talk about the type and state training that we're talking about and we'll talk about state some other time. Yeah. Um, so the first thing you know, to, to recognize here is that the service contracts are, are king. When developers you know, first hit, hit in the projects, at least and this is how I usually am too, um, you know, the very first thing they sit there and say is, uh, you know, okay, well, t show me the database and show me the tables and, you know, let, let me take a look at the structures that you're working with and whatnot. And so having said that, you know, that's really not where you're, you're, you should be looking at. You should really be looking at the service contracts, the objects that are defined there, the entities that are defined there, the method and operations that are defined there. Um, because just as an example, one of the things that we're going through right now is that we are radically, uh, with the help of D DBAs, we are radically redesigning um, the underlying database structures that uh, you know we, we've are, we've used in in curriculum management and uh, and uh, for enrollment course slice um, because they were designed you know without any sort of like DBA input initially. They were just sort of de designed by uh, developers as they were going along without sort of you know formal formal training in uh, designing the database section. Um, but so, so having said that, you know, but if you had designed screens that went against the services, um, the service contract designs, you wouldn't have to change any of those screens because the underlying data model got changed. Um, we, we, we take a, a top-down approach in terms of de defining our, the services that we have. And so we, we take, uh, you know, we have... We initially do some designs, rough designs on the wiki where we can all talk about it and easily change it. But then we express it in Java uh, as it Java interfaces with, with CFX annotations. So we then generate WSDL out of the thing. But again, the, the key thing is, is that this is sort of still an abstraction um, because we also didn't generate documentation out of it. And we'll, we'll give you links to that to see where the documentation is. So you can sort of easily read and understand the contracts. But it's also, you know, that right now we're using CFX to go to web services, but we may, you know, get some other future transform to 
express the, the semantics that are defined in the Java interfaces, you know, as, as maybe in PHP or as RESTful interfaces or, or JSON or something like that. Um, so I, this is just the, the, the fun little screen to show you a seesaw, you know, where, you know, the, the, the idea is the reason for the service contracts is that it's the stable point. You know, we're trying to design something that's going to last a while, and I don't know if you realize this, but technology moves forward fast and, and furious. Um, and, and so the idea is that we want to be able to change one part without changing the other. So during curriculum management, we had implementations, um, you know, using JPA and SQL, uh, as the as the as the implementation, but we use GWT on the interface. But now we're keeping the same implementations, but we want to switch to a KRAD user interface, um, and so we can do that without having to worry about it. And then, as technology changes, you know, there was a recommendation. I don't know if we're going to follow it, but there's a recommendation in our less technology review that we maybe explore NoSQL databases. Um, you know, more like the uh, the big tables uh, of Google. And maybe even swap out our, our relational databases and put in certain situations NoSQL. And then later on, who knows? Maybe we'll go to HTML5, and maybe we'll be need, needing to support uh, other user interfaces for mobile devices and whatnot. Um, so the whole point is, is that it's the service contract that's the midpoint that allows us to to manage that and change one without having to change the other. And then it's, it's, it's also just affects implementation, too, so that the contract is the stable point so that, you know, a school doesn't have to adopt the entire suite of uh, applications and that you, you can just have wrappers to your legacy system so that if UAT wanted to implement pieces of it at a time and phase it in, and it's not one big bang. And, in fact, that's exactly what um, uh, University of Washington is doing with their uh, my plan that they're building. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But they're wrapping their legacy legacy systems in in uh, Kowali service contracts, and that way, you know, when Kowali comes up and actually has you know more mature, ready to go pieces for that, they can actually just use them. Um, just from a from a practicality standpoint, just trying to throw out there, the the contracts that we're designing, we're designing a lot with a lot of emphasis on configurability and extensibility. Um, so if you've ever gone and looked at some certain kinds of contracts where they, uh, they define every little detail about, uh, about the object and how long the field should be or, or the details of which, what are the valid values allowed in this particular field, um, we actually don't do that. We sort, of, we sort of push that off into the dictionary and into type state configuration, the idea being that that's where we expect schools Individual schools should be able to do a lot of their manipulations for that. That's for my school as opposed to for some other school, be able to make changes in, in those areas. Similarly with workflow, and then again with, with as we said, rules for, um, for doing things, making the first class citizens. Um, then this is just a diagram sort of showing, and if you, it's hard to sort of read some of the, some of the pieces there. But it sort of just shows you that, that, we're, that the contracts aren't just used at that web service boundary, that we also use it to be able to segment the, the logic that goes in at, at each particular um, layer. If you, if you actually look at the, the implementations that we're building, we sort of have a, a persistence layer that goes to JPA, um, but, but then we have a separate validation layer that, that maybe has some hard-coded validations in there or maybe calls the... the um, the, the dictionary to do some validations and whatnot. And then we have another layer that does pure calculations on data values and does in, inject and is allowed to is used to inject um, manipulations of the thing. And then there's another authorization layer where it actually does the checking of the thing, um, uh, whether or not the you know the person has the right to do this uh, access. The main point there again is the swappability that if we if we needed to replace our um, our persistence layer, with a different kind of persistence, we could, and we wouldn't lose all of that code that's above it. But it isn't just a future nice, nice thing to have. Um, it, it makes it really hard to, I don't know about you, but it makes it really hard to, to test, unit test a calculation layer if you have to actually go to a real database. And even if you're going to a, 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 a Derby database that you create on the fly, which is how someone's it's done, it takes a long time to do it. And so we also have it so that we have mock implementations 
or the, 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 the persistence isn't really persistent, it's, it's just backed by some hash maps. And it allows us to be able to test and unit test each of the layers individually um, and separately before we then stick them in the full stack and do like a full integration test. Um, just want to talk about, in, you know, uh, in terms of when we design them, uh, but, you know, we're, we're a service team and, and we think we're amazing, but we know we, we screw up on, on things sometimes. But we, here's what things we do try to do. We try to make sure that the contract does everything that you need it to do. If it doesn't, then, you know, don't be afraid of coming back and telling us, hey, you messed up here. This, I, need, I need a different method to get this done. Um, and, and that's, you know, par, part of the thing is, that, you know, we ha there's no way for us to have been actually proved out that the designs that we've got will fully 100% all the needs that are going on in there. And so um, what we really need to make sure is we have feedback from you in, in terms of that, uh, of that kind of stuff. Um, common patterns. One of the things that we try to do is we try to follow a strict pattern. So once you learn one service, you should be able to pick up the next service much faster because they all follow. You say, oh, yeah, well, there, there's always a this. There's always a that. Oh, this is the pattern how, they, how they, your, the create statement works. This is how the, the uh, other one works. We also have, have lots of discussions about names um, we, and uh, make sure we get names that are, resonate with a lot of different people. And then I'm just going to quickly jump to documentation. Um, it's more than Java Docs. We, we have a, a much more fleshed out documentation. And I'm taking longer. Next. Um, yeah, so then these are, these are a bunch of rules that we have. I'm not going to read them uh, all completely, you know, but just like we don't, using, we don't use overloaded method names and stuff like that. And there's actually two pages of rules, so we're going to skip through this. <laughs> You can read it. We'll give you that. I think I'm, that's it, right? So, yep. Okay. Yours, Kathy. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the design process. Also, actually, I want to pause here. Um, are there any questions? Do you have questions along the way? One of the things that's hard is I cannot watch the chat at the same time. So I guess there's no questions. Okay, so this is going to be a little bit about um, how we do some things, and then we'll actually go look at some of the artifacts that Norm was referring to. So the, the first thing is there's a whole um, A-team uh, analysis team that um, has been the primary group to collect and um, consolidate and refine um, business requirements from um, all, our, all our, our partner institutions that are part of the consortium. Those are high-level features, they're requirements, they work very hard on business terminology, their user stories, business process models, um, candidates for rules or, or, or logic, um, and then, of course, all the, the details of the data. So basically what we do is we start pulling that information in a couple of different ways. Initially, we start looking at those high-level business artifacts. We, we group those into areas, and we start defining our candidate services. Um, this is really the, the list of what we think all the services are. It helps us, um, even if we don't know exactly what's going to be in a service, we start describing generally what's going to be in that service so we can understand boundaries. In some cases, a service may blossom into more than one surface, service. In other cases, things may um, group together. I'm going to try something that may actually make my computer fall apart. But I'm going to try it, and we'll see what happens. Oh, that probably wasn't a good idea. Not a good idea at all. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, if I have to close this program and restart, we'll get... Oh, look, there it goes. We'll give it a moment. Okay, good. It worked. So uh, this is this is um, the uh, some of the artifacts that we develop over on the wiki. And again, we're now in the early parts of designing a service. And so what you'll see here is the list of um, each of the services. We've grouped them by various classes. I'm going to talk about classification systems a little bit later. But in many of these, you'll see that there's an actual service, but there's also a sandbox. And the sandbox is where we do a lot of our um, figuring out and sharing of ideas and, um, and starting. Once that's actually 
got enough um, structure and um, and definition, then we'll start working on the contract and go from there. Um, anyone is welcome to look at this. It's the link is there. It actually works from the the, the uh, PowerPoint, and so you can see all the various services that we've started to identify. Um, the next thing that happens is, you know, again, we start digging into those logical entity diagrams. We start looking um, and exploring how, how the layering is going to work. We start defining what are going to be the operations and what are going to be the data bits. So now I'm going to try another link. Now I'm feeling really confident. So this is what I was saying. Once we pass sort of sandbox structure, now we're in what we call our actual service description repository. Um, we have a lot of very standard um, ways for how we describe these. Um, let me know if I need to bump up the, uh, the font size on this. Each of, our, each of our contracts then has a home, a base page where we describe the um, class it is. In this case, if it's a class two and there's an underlying class one, we'll include a link to that. We'll have a narrative about that particular um, service that should be consumable by um, business analysts, A-team folks, actual you know, SMEs or subject matter experts that we've been working with the project, as well as by programmers. So we try to describe, you can click into some more detail here, we'll describe key concepts, some of the assumptions, and some of the other processes that may have bubbled up as we start working with the contract. Um, the next big thing we have is this entity diagram. The entity di diagrams are, are helpful. This is where Norm was saying, be careful. This is not an ER diagram. It is not a database model. It is not. It is a, is a service entity concept diagram. Um, the standards we use within our diagramming techniques are the, the blue color is the, are the entities that are actually part of this service. The Peachy yellow color are types. As, as Norm mentioned, we heavily use type to configure um, throughout the system. And then red are external services that are part, or are referred to within this service. So they're touch points to other things. When it's a class two going to a class one, we'll have a layering diagram, which will describe what's happening at the, at the business layer class two service but then also at the atomic level. So underneath the covers, if you were to look at academic time period, all there are is their time periods and their milestones. All of those then get realized as these tangible entities up at the business level. Um, the next thing I will go to here, I'm going to open that in a new tab. This is the, this is the actual wiki realization of the Javadoc um, contract interface that Norm was talking about. So here you can see here are all our operations. If I go click on one of these, it'll take me to some information about that. And this is all, like again, generated from that Javadoc. In here, I can actually see what the general um, uh, footprint or pattern of, of the contract operation is, and I can actually then go delve into the um, message structures that describe the data. Any questions? Great. So at some point, we've got a formal contract, and we've actually got code artifacts. I'm actually going to skip that right now because I know you guys are developers. If we get into the code, I may lose you completely. And you'll probably want to do it on your own anyway. So at some point, we get to a release contract. As development begins, and this is where, remember I showed you in the beginning the picture where it was the core team and then the parallel teams. Before each milestone or right at the beginning of the milestone, we will publish the contracts that will be in in some um, state of doneness, we're, we're targeting somewhere between 50 and 80 percent of the implementation. So the contract's completely done and the implementations are well on their way. We'll release that out to the parallel team's development. As things happen and as changes are needed, to the extent that things are made to the contract level, um, those are going to go through a formal contracting and release process. We will then be in the business of releasing versions of contracts. Changes to the implementation and changes to type and state, which actually model and configure that service, are things that we can work together with and negotiate and wouldn't require a, a contract release. 
So this is just a laundry list of the uh, various uh, um, artifacts, the wiki artifacts um, that we just looked at a little bit, and then the coding and um, artifacts. I don't know if you want to jump in and say anything about these, Norm. No, I just mentioned the code artifacts. That you know, there are the Java interfaces and message structures. Um, the, you know, the, the actual beans. Uh, there's a Java interface, and there's actual beans that hold that stuff. And we have web services. You know, generation out of that. Um, but key thing is, we also have constants files for the types and states. So if you ever find yourself feeling like you want to t code in a string, um, don't. It should be in a constants file somewhere. Um, and so we have a, a place for all the constants for types and states and, and other usage keys and stuff like that. Um, and then we have a dictionary, and then we have the mock impulse. So in terms of the classification of the services, really what we were looking for was a way to provide some governance around, around the services. Um, and also continue to define some of the rules about how those services might work. So class one, and there are going to be quality students, and as we get to the full list, I think you'll understand a little bit more why the, the classifications are helping us. They're part of quality student proper, they're single, they're self-contained, atomic, and they aren't going to refer to other services. They're, they're the most stable, and so they have the most rigorous governance. These are the ones that we really want to get right as right as possible from the beginning um, as these provide sort of an anchor for the overall um, application. Um, the class ones, we, we used to have anything atomic was a class one and, and we just had a, a, a service workshop, God, was it only a week and a half ago? Um, and, uh, and, and we actually revisited this and, and we made a distinction between what we're now calling class one and core. So class one are also these abstract concepts. If you see these examples, that probably looks like gibberish to you. But to anyone who's been on the project, we know that an LU is a learning unit, and a LUI is a learning unit instance. An LPR is a LUI person relation. LRR is a learning result record, etc. So these are abstract concepts. So similar to what Norm was talking about in the beginning with the learning unit, there are lots of opportunities for an abstract concept can then be modeled vis-a-vis -a, -vis a type into a tangible, meaningful business concept. So the LPR, which is the Louis person relation, so that's a person's relationship to an instance of a learning unit, could be a student's enrollment in a course. It could be the teacher's association with the course. It could be an advisor's association with the, with the program. So all of those under the covers down at the class one abstract concept level are Louis person relations. So this is the way we think we've got the underpinnings for what can continue to be configured into the next generation student system. Core is the next, oops, sorry. Core is the next classification. I point and I happen to click too. And, and core are really all of what class one are, but rather than being abstract, these are really more admin, single-use things, so they're in business speak. Um, the other issue, and, and the reason why they're identified as core, is we think they will be shared across multiple Kuali student modules. So, for instance, curriculum management and enrollment will both be leveraging the comment service, the document service. Um, and, and as we move forward, we believe that concepts that we're introducing now with enrollment will also be useful as we push forward past enrollment to other modules within Kuali student. So holds, exemptions, um, the idea of a room, an appointment, a schedule. Actually, appointment already, we know that appointments, we're using them right now for registration appointments. That work is happening right now with the East Coast One parallel development team. Um, we know that, those, that also that same model could be used for advisor appointments. So class twos um, have now been refined a bit to separate the idea of, of, uh, of composed and, and, um, and really something that is realized vis-a-vis -a, -vis a type. So for instance, we have a course service, which is really a learning unit of type course. Um, similarly, we have a course offering, we've got a program, and actually I should have um, Pulled it, uh, oh no, academic calendar, sorry, I confused that with academic record. So, and the academic calendar. So these are really, uh, which is a, um, 
a big typing of the ATP service. So really, these are things that we expect they will change as part of an institution. We're going to do a configuration based on the input from the analysis team and sort of their um, collective uh, agreed upon most intersection with all the institutional needs, that's what we'll develop as part of our reference implementation, but we know very well that each individual institution is going to be changing those. Um, so getting back to the governance aspect of this, this is where we expect there will be more change is in class two services. These will be less stable. We expect change and we will build that in. Composed, the idea there is that they're really truly across lots of services and probably is, is more of a view. Right now, we think the academic record, which we haven't um, really gotten past preliminary design on, but we imagine that that is going to be something that is going to have to look into pretty much every aspect of student that we can think of right now in a moment. So the next one is, uh, is contributions. We needed a way to say, okay, these are things that um, are going to be contributions to KS. They're not part of KS proper, um, but we really hope they will be soon. Um, the two big examples we have going on to that right now are the My Plan from the University of Washington that, uh, that Norm referred to earlier, where Kamal, who used to be on the services team, and then he defected, um, but that, that was a good defection, uh, is, is heading up the my, my Plan development. He's using the entire stack. He's using services. He's actually pushing us to move ahead quicker on a couple of the enrollment services because he those as part of my plan. The other one is um, Sigma Systems is actually working on our student, um, it's, it's student accounts. Sorry, I got the wrong name here. I said student financials, but it's students account system, right? Anyway. Um, class four or rice services. I know you, you heard a lot about that this morning um, as part of Larry's presentation. And I'm actually going to talk a little bit more about how the services team is interacting on a couple of those, those rice entities right now. Um, but these are ones that really we need to remember that as quality student, we don't control those services. We can try to impact them and we can stack as many votes through the ARC as possible, uh, but really that governance is outside of us. So, um, you know, this is, again, I know you, you talked about some of these. The couple that we care about a lot right now are KRAD and KRMS, and we'll talk a little bit more about KRMS in a little bit. The last um, category of things which we haven't totally um, sorted out is things where we know we're going to have these significant touch points and an implementation is going to be outside of the system. We have kind of two flavors of those. Scheduling is one where to the extent it's been treated as a black box, great. That, but we know there's going to be a lot of back and forth with scheduling as we're building the um, course offering. Then there are going to be other systems that are primarily feeder systems, like admissions for students, HR for instructors, LMS is a, is a system we'll probably push out to. So um, the, the, the fidelity of, the, of those um, services is probably going to be a little looser, but we know we're going to want to formalize those exchange points. So this is just a quick picture to show, you know, again, the idea of the abstract service and the tangible ones. We've already got credential programs, majors and minors that all came out of um, curriculum management along with credit courses and exams. Um, things that are, are probably more future, but they aren't going to be too future for a couple of institutions like Maryland, who's in the middle of curriculum management, or things like certificate programs, projects, and theses. Interesting thing about those is that some of that's all kind of between a course and a program. They might be multi-semester, multi but they're not really a specific program. So um, I, 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 um, I think it will be interesting as we continue to push out Class 2 services wrapped over Class 1 on those. Um, and then we actually looked at this one already, but, you know, the academic time period could be a holiday calendar, an academic calendar could be a term, a milestone can be a key date for registration, it could be a holiday or it could be some kind of, you know, a cal event. Pausing to see if anyone has any questions, because I tend to talk without even breathing, so. Wow, really quiet group. You guys trained out. Um, 
Okay, so the race strategy, the race strategy for race modules. Um, our the general approach is let's leverage as much as we can. So um, I think you heard a lot about KRED uh, this morning, and you've got um, you've got training on KRED next week. So I'm just going to push over that. Um, on in terms of Kim, um, there are some gaps. Uh, one of the big gaps, for instance, is people to people relations. And, and so there are going to be things that we're going to have to figure out and push on with Kim. Um, frankly, from an overall uh, priority standpoint, that's probably later in this year, so we haven't pushed on that a lot. The area where we are um, heavily dependent and heavily invested right now is on the rules system. Um, if anyone is familiar with curriculum management, we had a, um, a pretty elaborate statement service which allowed us to author rules within curriculum management. We did not need to execute rules, so we sort of left that part all out. Um, I think Larry talked a little bit this morning about a POC from the summer where we took some of the rules that we had defined in the statement service, proved that we could model that logic in KRMS, and then execute them. Great. That all worked great. As we've been developing the enrollment piece, we found a need to not only be able to just execute rules that were authored as part of prerequisites, for instance, in curriculum management, but we have whole business processes that we need to validate. So a second POC came along uh, later in, I guess it was more near the end of last year, where we had, as services had outlined, this idea of a process service that would let you execute a set of, um, of instructions or tasks or checks. Each of those checks in itself invoke a rule, but the actual layering of that process was something that we needed to also be able to control and surface to let people configure it because we know all institutions are different. Um, as part of that process, uh, we have. We also needed to push things through to, to rules. The, the main reason I'm bringing that up is as we started looking at it all, the idea of having a statement service and a KRMS started not making a lot of sense. And so now, in fact, what we're in the process of doing, and this is with one of the South Africa teams and then um, one of our service architects will be probably 75% on that effort, we're working taking KRMS and building it out to support the features that we had in the statement service, which are authoring, but also some natural language support, and also the idea of being able to template rules. So that's a big investment. That's actually going on right now. So much of enrollment is going to be dependent upon the success of that, that um, that, that is probably one of our um, critical um, efforts going on right now. Um, You've heard of Kim. Now we have Com. Com is organization management, and um, it's important on the enrollment path, but probably not until the end of this year. Meanwhile, there are a couple efforts going on within the race community. One of them, actually, um, coincidentally, being driven by University of Washington. Um, to work more on formalizing the, the Kuali org module. Separate from that, last year, Michigan State University had done an implementation of org. Um, that's, that's pretty good. The idea now is how can we leverage that implementation with some of the contract work that student has done on organization and basically... Um, I'll just say it, replace what has been there for COM. I think COM's been there for a while. I don't know all the history of it. If anyone does, feel free to type it. No, there is no COM. It's a placeholder. So now the idea is then to prop that up as, as, a, as, as a rice module. I, I think the important, you know, every, it's, it's like Norm said in the beginning when we had those original entities. Org is everywhere. It is critical. It's critical to a lot of things within, you know, student systems and actually across university systems. So um, further out for us will be, um, you know, Ken, which is, you know, notification. Um, the 
the short story on that is most of the projects, I don't actually, I don't think any of the projects really use Ken for notification, um, but we probably should be because, again, these are common requirements that we have across the Kuali projects, not just student, but all the other, you know, whether it's financials or the HR piece or whatever, have um, common needs around notification. So I'm hoping that, you know, later this year or earlier next year, we'll start building that out. Q is actually a, a, a pretty robust workflow um, engine. For us, it's further out just because within the enrollment module, we've pushed that work out to year two. Pausing again. Did I miss anything, Norm? Mm, don't, th don't think so. Okay, so this is, this is a little bit about, you know, sort of where, where we are. Um, this is actually a, a diagram that we had put together to describe poor slice, which was the, um, the narrow, but, well, I, I, maybe it's not narrow, wide but shallow or narrow but deep, depending on how you look at it. We actually went all the way from the UI to the database on a small set of functionality across enrollment as part of um, proving out our, our environment and, and some of our service assumptions last year for, in preparation for enrollment. So we had a, a, an academic calendar, a course offering, a course reg, a grading, and academic, academic record service. Those were backed up by all those acronyms. Um, underneath, we had, you know, KRAD was actually the user interface layer, and then we were leveraging some KRMS for rules, some KIM for identity, and then the other pieces are just in flux because we think we're going to get there with those RICE modules, just not yet. So this is, um, this is a list of all the services that we had, service contracts that we had from R1. And these are the ones that we, additional ones that we know we're going to need um, for enrollment. Um, and this isn't all of them, but it's quite a few of them. I think the point is, I, I think the last time I did it was something like 66. Going from curriculum management to enrollment was um, kind of magnitudes of, uh, of, of complexity and size. So um, what I can say to all of you is welcome, glad you're on board, and going to be helping us with all of this. Um, so what's next? Uh, uh, like I said, I, I think I've actually talked through a lot of this. It's really um, continuing to tee up rules as these first-class citizens. So there's the KRMS strategy, which I talked about. The second one is, is really the second area I referred to a little bit when I talked about the POC, but it's, it's really the other part of rules is not just authoring rules and having natural language translations of those and executing those, although all that has to work. But it's also how do we really expose or surface those rules in the application? And then because of the nature of being a, a collaborative project, um, a community source project that's got to solve a lot of different people's problems. How do we do that in a way that's configurable by an end user? How can we actually surface um, that logic for doing that? And the two concepts we have going right now are this process service, which uh, actually is going to start being, um, we've done the POC and it will go out to South Africa to team for working on in a couple of weeks. Um, but then we, Again, I, I mentioned we just had a, um, a services workshop. We started envisioning a, a new global environment. Um, I forgot the setting word. Global environment setting service, where which is really going to be, um, if you look through the work from the analysis team all over the place, you'll say, oh, it defaults here, and oh, this is configurable, and, and this should start out this way, but then that's configurable. And you hear this configurable word all over. In teasing that apart, um, the idea with this global environment setting service is that we will be able to provide a way to formalize that level of configuration in a way that, again, similar to what we're doing with the process service, we can expose it to the user for doing things like setting the default for max and min credit load when you register as a freshman, when you register as a sophomore. Mm -hmm. so all these things are all over the place within the enrollment system. So how do we start to codify those so that we can um, inject those into rules 
and or use those as part of another process. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let see if Norm, you have anything else to add there. Well, not sure. think, yeah, well, I wanted to clarify when I said how to expose and service the rules in the application. There's actually two halves to that. And one is, you know, that she explained the business user side of how do you expose sort of turning on and off or, or supplying a little parameter to a, to a rule in a way that's natural for the business user. But the other thing is, is how, how do you actually invoke the rule from within the actual code of the application, which is a little different question. Um, and, and we're, 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 we're we're, we're, we're struggling with, we we're, think we're coming up, we're struggling, we're struggling with, but we're trying to come up with a way to keep the footprint as small as possible so we don't, you know, have the, the, the same logic, you know, replicated all over the place. But instead, it's sort of, um, you know, you just have the pointer to the KRMS rule in the actual implementation code. And then, you know, that way you could just change the KRMS rule and that, that, that is what then does the calculation or whatever. So just okay. understand that that's the kind of thing we're trying to do here. Yeah, and I, and I think it's funny if you if you start teasing apart requirements. It's like, well, our current system does it now. Well, how does it do it? Oh, it's buried in the code somewhere. Do you have a list of all those? No, we'd have to you know deconstruct the code. <laughs> so I think we're also trying to to avoid avoid some of that. Bingo. I I think that's what we had, and it looks like we have you know maybe seven or eight minutes left if there are questions. Wow, we went fast. We did. Maybe too fast here. Too fast. Yeah. Have we? I'm I'm flipping over to the chat now. Really quiet group. Rajiv, what did we forget from your perspective? No, I think I think you guys did a fantastic job here, and both Larry and I touched upon some of these things. Just touched barely upon some of these things when we did our onboarding earlier. Mm -hmm. So this was great because you drilled in into some of these concepts. Um, you know, uh, Mesba is already embedded on your team, so I'm sure he's going to have more questions that he'll follow up with you on. Um, and Sambit's here too, along right alongside him. David, did you have any comments or any feedback? Or Mickey, same with you. Any comments or any feedback? It doesn't have to be a question. Yeah, I think uh, I'm uh, I'm a good, and it's uh, thanks, Casey and the Norm. Very informative. Pretty good. Thanks. That's Adam. No, no comments. Um, thank you. Did a great job. As far as I can tell, <laughs> and I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Well, well, I'll also say, you know, I I, I think I'm sure I'll make sure I I send you this deck because we it's it's been revised up until the last few minutes. Um, but, but also, if there are any questions, you know, we're here. Please, please ping us. Please ask for more. And, Mickey, hopefully this was helpful to you because you've already been embedded on the West Coast team and been grappling with some of the concepts even without this level of onboarding. So hopefully this catches you up on some of those things you wondered about, right? Yeah, it, it's been great. Thank you very much. Okay, great. All right. Well, thanks. I, I, I give back everybody six minutes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank, okay. you. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Kathy. I think I need them. All right. Bye.